I am Julie Decker, President and CEO of the FSU Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our seventh episode of our Webinar Wednesday series. Throughout the series, we have brought expert alumni into your homes to provide you practical and relevant information, and hopefully they've informed you and helped you navigate our current challenges. Many of you tuning in today are members of the Alumni Association, and I thank you for your commitment to the university and to the FSU Alumni Association. I would also like to thank our corporate partners again for their generous support in making programs like this series possible. Thank you. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard received his BS, MS, and PhD in physical meteorology from Florida State University. He was the first African-American to receive a PhD from Florida State University's Department of Meteorology. He is also the second African-American to preside of the American Meteorological Society. Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor, Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. Dr. Shepard was the 2013 president of the American Meteorological Society, and he serves as director of the president, uh, director of the Department of Geography, where he was previously the associate department head. Dr. Shepard is frequently sought as an expert on weather, climate, and remote sensing. He routinely appears, as you may well know, on CBS Face the Nation, NOVA, The Today Show, CNN, Fox News, The Weather Channel, and several other notable um, channels. Today, he'll share his insight with us about the upcoming hurricane season, the impact warmer temperatures could have on COVID-19, and his personal experience navigating the pandemic, which is going to be my favorite thing to hear about, I think, at home through his newly published book, 40 Days and 40 Nights, Daily Tales and Lessons from a Suburban Home During the Quarant Coronavirus Quarantine. We are delighted to have you with us today, Dr. Shepard. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. And I think I got your uh, director title wrong, so you can correct me on that. Oh, no, no worries. I, I just want to give a little love to the Atmospheric Sciences Program, yeah. which I am the director of, but I am a member of the Ge Department of Geography at the University of Georgia. So thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's been a pleasure to actually get to know you. I know we have some mutual ties in the yeah. sense that you were at the University of Georgia before leading our Florida State Alumni Association. So uh, like me, I know you share some allegiances to yeah. the dogs and the, the Seminoles, but to everyone out there, let's not get it twisted. I am a Seminole, <laughs> I believe garnet and gold, three degrees from Florida State University bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate from the meteorology department. So it's an honor that, that the, the Alumni Association and Julie and her colleagues would actually invite me to, to do this. Uh, it's been a, I've had a chance to go back and look at some of the series and it's really been enlightening to see. I have a couple of things on my mind. And so those of you that are familiar with it, and I know that there are some people that are tuning in to this that may be familiar uh, with me through various formats. Uh, I do host a show on the Weather Channel on a podcast called Weather Geeks. Uh, I also write for Forbes magazine in addition to my quote unquote day job as a professor and director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Georgia. And I was asked to talk about the upcoming hurricane season. Um, many of our alum are in the Florida region or coastal regions and so I know that's of interest to many people. Uh, also asked to talk about we're obviously, all of us, we're in the same boat living through coronavirus, COVID-19, and the quarantine period. And so there have been questions, speculation about what the role of weather or heat as we move into the summer season, how that will impact uh, coronavirus. So uh, a few things that I want to say about that. And then I also will end with a discussion. Uh, I didn't ask for this, by the way. Um, Julie and her colleagues thought it would be neat uh, if, uh, if I talked a little bit about uh, our experiences as a family uh, here in coronavirus quarantine, and qu quarantine is in quotes, uh, and a book that we wrote that kind of developed organically out of my wife's social media posts. She's a, an FSU alum as well. She has a master's degree from the School in Urban and Regional Planning from Florida State. In fact, we met while I was finishing up my doctorate there and she was in her master's program. So uh, this whole family is Florida State down over here. So just want to establish that. But I want to start 
with the hurricane season. I, I don't know, but I can't really see how many of you may live in Florida or may be impacted by hurricanes. But even as we speak this morning, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but we have a named storm. We have Tropical Storm Bertha just off the Florida coast. And I, I'll tell you, even as a meteorologist, someone that pays very close attention to what's happening with the weather, this one spun up on us really quickly. I mean, if you had asked me uh, a week ago, you see any hurricanes making landfall or tropical storms for that matter making landfall, I would have said no. <clears throat> but we have tropical storm birth. It's gonna be a very short lived tropical storm. It's going to impact the Carolinas. But what's interesting about this, if you're paying attention, and I suspect it, because this is a Florida State alumni group primarily and others, probably a fairly hurricane savvy group, that's the second named storm that we've had in the year 2020. 2020 is the year that just keeps on giving, isn't it? I mean, this is a really strange year. And we've already had two named storms. Hurricane season doesn't start until June 1st. So a question that often I get, a couple of questions. Does this mean that we're going to have an active season. By, by the way, we have a little flickering here. Give me one moment because one of my forward lights seems to be having its own issues today. Maybe it's uh, having us a little bit. Give me one second. I'm broadcasting from my home studio here and so I have some front lighting and I think one of them was deciding to go out, but I think there's still enough lighting that we can make that work. But the question that you may have in your mind is, does this early hurricane season mean uh, that we're going to have a really bad hurricane season? Well, those two aren't connected. But the reality is, if you have followed recent announcements from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, we're expecting an active hurricane season in 2020, above normal conditions. What that means, in a given year, we might get 12 named storms. Uh, NOAA is projecting, and I wanted to pull this up so that I could get the exact number because they give a range more so than an actual number. NOAA is actually projecting 13 to 19 named storms this year. 13 to 19. We've, we're already, we've already had two. They're projecting six to 10 hurricanes. Uh, six to 10. In a normal year, out of the named storms, six become hurricanes. This year we're projecting six to 10. And of those six to 10, three to six are projected to be major hurricanes. Now let's do a little meteorology one-on-one here. I come from Florida State University's meteorology department. It's now the Department of Earth, Atmosphere, and Ocean Science. But I, I come from the meteorology department there, Love Building. Shout out to anyone listening that had a class in the Love Building, because that's where I spent a lot of my time. Hurricane season starts June 1st. But typically, the peak of the hurricane season is not until early September. And that is because many of you are familiar, because you go to the beach, of a very scientifically geeky term called heat, uh, thermal inertia and specific heat. The land heats up much more rapidly than water. The air temperature does as well. So we start getting warm in June in the atmosphere, in the air. But the water temperature takes a bit longer to warm, so it really reaches its peak warmness around September or so. So that's why the peak of the hurricane season is typically around that time. But one of the things that we've seen in recent decades, for the last several years, I think the last six years in a row, we've had early named storms. We've already had two storms. We've had Tropical Storm Arthur and now Tropical Storm Bertha. Now, early named storms don't necessarily mean that we will have an active season, but there are other factors that we look at that determine the activity of the season. Now, the Colorado State Tropical Meteorology Project, NOAA, a group at Penn State University, even the Weather Channel, which uh, I, I'm affiliated with in some ways, uh, they use things like how much rain fell in uh, Western Africa the previous season, or what are the sea surface temperatures like? Are we in an El Nino, which we're not, right, by the way, or are we in a La Nina? There's some evidence that we are about to enter a La Nina pattern. And well, you might be saying, well, Dr. Shepard, how does that all relate to whether we're gonna get more hurricanes in the Atlantic and so forth? Typically, if we're in an El Nino, an El Nino pattern, uh, 
that brings the jet stream a bit further south on average and creates a lot more wind shear. And as you all may know, hurricanes don't like to form in an environment where there's a lot of wind shear. But if we're not in an El Nino, and in fact, if we're in a La Nina pattern, the jet stream stays further north. And so if all the other conditions are in place, these hurricanes don't have as much on average wind shear and so they can develop. So all of these factors are converging to suggest that we are going to experience a, a, an above normal season. Now, let me give you my take on that as a, as a professional in this field. Take that with a grain of salt. And what I mean by that is this, these seasonal outlooks, they get a lot of media coverage. People will start talking about, oh, we're gonna have our hurricane season that's active. My take on this is always the following. It only takes one. It only takes one hurricane in a season to be a bad hurricane season. Think about Hurricane Michael that affected the panhandle of Florida up in the region where Florida State is. Devastating category five storm. Now, if you're affected by Hurricane Michael, whether you're in Florida, it even affected parts of Georgia. Mm -hmm. You don't care whether 13 storms were projected that year. You know that one storm is what caused you problems. And so uh, we use these seasonal outlooks for planning purposes, for supply chain, for businesses and so forth. And they do provide some guidance and they, they've been shown to have some skill. But the, the message that I would like to convey to all of you that are listening is that we should prepare irrespective of how, how many hurricanes are expected because it only, only does take one. So um, by the way, if you are on Twitter, do me a favor right now and go and follow me on Twitter at Dr. Shepherd 2013. Uh, Shepherd is spelled S H E P H E R D, and then doctors is D R. So at Dr. Shepherd 2013. Because I like to engage after the fact. There may be some of you that have questions later that I don't get to. And so you feel free to tweet me uh, and so forth, and we, we can have a conversation there because I'm very active in Twitter. And so I want to continue this discussion even as we move on. All right. I want to shift gears now. But certainly, if there are questions in the Q&A part of this discussion about hurricanes and so forth, we can certainly talk about those as well. But I want to shift gears now because we are all struggling. And I, and I say that somewhat in jest because this is a very serious situation uh, in Florida, Georgia, and around the nation um, with coronavirus-19. I, I told my wife, I was in Florida back in early March, towards the end of February, because my daughter is a competitive volleyball player. So she was playing in a big sunshine qualifier volleyball tournament there in Orlando. And, you know, even before going to that tournament, I said to my wife, you know, I don't know if we should be doing this. This, this corona, I, I knew then, I said, I told her, my wife actually often tells people this back in February, I said, this coronavirus is something different. I can just see it. I could just, I'm not an expert in, in um, infectious disease, but I, I understand data. I could tell that this one was something different. And so um, we're all in coronavirus, various stages of um, stay at home, shelter in place, social distancing. A lot, a lot of the states are starting to come a bit out of that now. I know there's some question about what Florida State and University of Georgia and others are going to, going to do about in, in uh, uh, person classes in the fall. It's trending that way, but I guarantee you those fall semesters will look very different than fall semesters that we remember as college students. But one of the questions that I have gotten, and I've written about this in Forbes, there are a couple of articles that I've, I've written in Forbes about this, is I think intuitively people think, well, the cold season, the flu, it goes away when it starts getting warm. And that's true. But here's the wild card. This novel coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, is a different beast. We don't understand it. And when I say we, I'm collectively meaning the scientific community that studies infectious diseases. So if you go to the CDC's website, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it clearly states that we aren't clear what warmer temperatures in the summer will do with coronavirus. There have been some recent peer-reviewed literature studies that have come forth that suggests that warm temperatures may help with coronavirus, but by, by no means a smoking gun. Well, let me give you something else that I've been paying attention to. I, again, by show of hands, and of course I can't see you, but some of you are listening. How many of you are in South Florida? What, probably some of you are that are listening to this. Well, if those of you in South Florida, you know that April was brutally hot. I mean, record-breaking heat. 
if there's someone listening from the desert southwest, from Arizona and various other places, brutally hot in April, three, degree, uh, three digit temperatures, 100 degree heat index. Think about April in Florida. Think about April in the desert southwest. Coronavirus still thrived, even though we were dealing with very oppressive heat. So that anecdotal evidence suggests that heat may not be the big player that we think it is if we just look at Florida in April, or if we look at Arizona in, in April. It was really hot, yet the virus still was thriving. So that's anecdotal. That's not a, a scientific opinion. I haven't published that, so take that for what it's worth. I would also point out that when the virus really started spreading and getting itself going in parts of Asia, some of the sort of more tropical Asian countries were very much experiencing or dealing with coronavirus, even though they were fairly hot human uh, countries. So that's the sort of ambivalent news. It's not really, I don't, I don't know that, that we can say too much. One of the things that I will recommend, however, one of my colleagues at the University of Georgia has noted that many of the studies that talk about how long the virus lives on surfaces, those are done at sort of room temperature, 70 or so. But he also talks about that at a, a certain temperatures, 135, 145 degrees, uh, you can start to kill the virus. So a lot of people, you know, when they put their mask in the dryers, if you're using fabric masks, the, the dryer, well, the heat from the dryer. But one of the things that I've started doing when I do leave, when I do have to run out to the, you know, a, a hardware store or the grocery store, I will leave my mask in the dash of the car. Because as you may know, because of that greenhouse effect that we get in our cars, it's really hot in our cars on summer days or hot days. Now, you know, unfortunately, people leave their, their pets and their kids and their cell phones, and then that's a very dangerous situation. So we never want to leave uh, a living being or uh, electronics in hot cars. But that heat in your car can work to your advantage in sanitizing those masks uh, and even a package that you might get from a uh, delivery service. So that's something I've started doing, just a little tip there um, for sticking your mask up on, on your, I've seen a lot of people have, have them on their mirrors and so forth. So I think that dealt with the first couple of questions that I was asked to deal with. I now want to transition to life in coronavirus quarantine. Now, I'm no different than anyone else out there. I have a family. My wife is, again, an FSU alum. She uh, did a master's degree there. We have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, both of whom had to complete their sophomore and seventh grade years online. So we have been living this quarantine, and I, I put quarantine in quotes on the book because technically we aren't in quarantine. You know, shout out to D-Nice and all the people doing club quarantine on Instagram and all that, but quarantine, actually, if you look up the meaning of the word quarantine, it's not what most of us are actually doing because we haven't been exposed to the virus and so have to quarantine ourselves. But we've certainly been in shelter in place and on lockdown. And oh my gosh, I'm on the struggle bus. Let me just, look, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I have PhDs and all these fancy titles, but I like to keep it real. I'm on the struggle bus because I'm an extrovert and I am someone that's not a homebody. So this has been a really interesting struggle for me. I'm not necessarily a handy person. I usually will sort of, if I, if I don't have expertise in doing something around the house, I'm happy if I can and blessed to be able to do so, pay someone to come do it. But I've stained my deck since I've been home. I'm, you know, planted a garden. These are things I don't normally do. But more interestingly, the book, my wife started posting on her Facebook page just these daily tidbits of her experience from each day, day one, day two, just different things. And at about day 10, I said, you know what? This is a historical moment in time. And there's something I want to capture. So I just started writing. I just started taking each of the days and expanding on what she was posting, and it became a book. And you know, it you know, it's out there on Amazon if you want to get it. Forty days, forty nights: uh, tales and lessons from a suburban family's coronavirus quarantine. And we just wrote the book because we figured that there are families just like ours struggling with the fact that my wife, who's a stay-at-home uh, mother who does things around the house, is not used to me being in the house all day. She's she used to be being at University of Georgia or at the Weather Channel or, or at some conference around the country. 
she's not used to the kids being here. We're not used to this sort of interaction because the kids are at school. So the realities of how your family and my family are adapted to that situation, that's what we wrote about. We wrote about the science, the interpretations. You know, there's been a lot of misinformation out there and it's some of the same misinformation I see in weather forecasting or with climate change. People have their own opinions about what, what they think should be happening. It's, you know, that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, by the way, this, uh, this psychological kind of perception that people know more about topics than they actually do. I think my other light's about to go out. Uh -oh. um, so we, by the way, the reason they're having trouble is I taped three different episodes of our Weather Geeks podcast today. So let me stop that one as well. So I may actually get even a little bit darker here. Maybe we can get the other one back on. Yeah, we're playing musical chairs with our lights here. The other one is charged back up. So I was still talking about uh, this idea that people have had their own perceptions about the models, coronavirus, about whether we should be staying in, should we not. Um, if you really want my perspective on what shapes people's perspectives on science, I, I have a TEDx UGA talk that actually got picked up by the larger TED group. So there's a TED talk out there. And I, I, if you just Google my name, Marshall Shepard, and three perception, or three biases that shape people's perceptions on science, that TED talk goes into these things like Dunning-Kruger effect and uh, cognitive biases and uh, so forth. And uh, I think they give you some insight. So since we, in this little lecture, Wednesday webinar lecture that I've been doing, I've talked about hurricanes and I've talked about coronavirus. Let me leave you with one really interesting synergy of the two. We make predictions of hurricane tracks and weather using models, but our models are very different from the kind of models the infectious disease community uses. We are actually solving very complex fluid dynamics and thermodynamics equations and meteorology in these models, and we predict how the atmospheric fluid changes in time. That's why whenever a student comes into my office at the University of Georgia and says, oh, Dr. Shepard, I've been fascinated by clouds all of my life. I love hurricanes. I love storm chasing. I want to be a meteorologist. But then the next question I say, well, that's good but how's your calculus, your partial differential equations, and your physics? Because to be a meteorologist or a climate scientist, you have to understand a lot about the atmosphere, the physics, the thermodynamics, the fluid dynamics. And so that's how we make weather predictions. Someone asked me one time, how do you guys actually make weather predictions? How do you know what the weather is going to be four days from now? And I said, well, we, we run these complex models that predict how the atmospheric fluid is going to change based on information about the atmosphere we give it today. To give you another example, um, if you could put a beach ball up in the Mississippi River somewhere around St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, because I understand the fluid flow of that river, how deep it is, its boundary conditions, its temperature, et cetera, I could actually design a set of equations that could predict where that beach ball would be three days from now downstream, because I'm just predicting the fluid change. Well, that's all we do in the atmosphere. And so that's how we make weather forecasts. But for coronavirus models, um, that for coronavirus models, we actually don't, and when I say we, I'm meaning their scientific community, they're not predicting this fluid change, this downstream atmospheric change. They're using all these demographics and statistical relationships between assumptions about how many people are social distancing, how many hospital beds. So you're not predicting a physical system. You're predicting based on these relationships and statistical observations and mathematical assumptions. So it's a different kind of modeling. But one of the things that I've noticed in the case of weather forecasting and coronavirus modeling, the public and even some policymakers are misinterpreting models. People want models to give them exact answers. People want me to tell them, yes, it's going to rain in the left corner of your backyard just about two inches from your tomato plant. And I can't do that. That's not how probabilistic modeling is done. It's the reason why we often as meteorologists hear people say, oh, weather forecasters, they're always wrong. Meteorologists are always wrong. When I hear that, I cringe because really when someone says that, it's really a reflection more of how much they don't understand about probability. 
I'm going to pose a question to you and I can't see you. So how many of you know what it means when I say there's a 30% chance of rain? Let's pause for a second and reflect on that. Because about half of you on this call don't know what it means. And I say that with love. Because most people don't know that it actually, we're talking about this 30% area and the probability of a certain percentage of the area. My son and I were actually tubing in, in the Helen, Georgia, and a, it started raining and a woman said, she didn't know who I was or what I did. She said, see those meteorologists, they're always wrong. There was a 20% chance of rain today and here it is raining. And I heard this and I'm thinking to myself, well, it wasn't 0%. But what she didn't realize is we were actually in that 20% of the forecasted area today. So that, there was nothing wrong about that forecast at all. But people tend to remember the occasional bad forecast, and we make them. In the same way, if our cook football kicker for Florida State made every field goal kick all year long, but he misses one in the bowl game that could have been for the national championship, that's the one people will remember. They don't remember all the field goals that he made all year long. Same thing with weather. People don't remember all the accurate every day. They remember the occasional bad one. And what I'm seeing with coronavirus is people are not understanding that there is uncertainty around these projections and that the initial conditions evolve over time as well. And so these models are going to change and they're going to have uncertainty. So we, they have to be used as guidance, not absolute truth. And so that's one of the things. So what I've done today in this little moment in time is I've tried to kind of paint a picture of sort of the hurricane season some things about COVID, coronavirus, and heat, and our experiences with coronavirus as a family. But woven through all of that are some perspectives on how to properly consume science, how to check ourselves at the door on what we know and don't know about other people's expertise, and just how to get through this as human beings. Because at the end of the day, I am not a meteorologist or an atmospheric scientist first. I'm a father and a husband and someone is just generally concerned about the well-being of others. So uh, I'm going to thank you all for joining in right now and then we'll pick up with a question and answer se uh, session here. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. That, as expected, was wonderful. And you're right, we did get excited about your book. Um, we were so thrilled to hear some of those stories because it's very disorienting for a lot of people for a number of reasons. And so um, all of that was um, wonderfully put. You know, I'm, I'm going to throw this at you to kind of get your opinion and feedback on, you sort of alluded to this towards the end of your talk about listening to experts when you're making hurricane predictions or perhaps warnings on COVID. And, oh, it wasn't as bad as they said. Well, that's a good thing, you know. So I, if you could expound on your thoughts on that of the human behavior of and, you know, if it's not as bad as expected, that's a good thing. That means science is working. Yeah, that means the science is working. And when you said human behavior, I don't know why a song by Bjork from the, yeah. from the, from the Sugar Cubes. Or, you know, I'm a big music fan. By the way, that's, I don't, you, we all have these things that have been getting us through this. Mm -hmm. For me, it's music. I have, I have rediscovered my music collection. I have thousands of CDs and songs and then my Spotify. So I've just, I, I just, music is helping me get through. But you, you, you raise a very good point. You know, one of the, I, I used to see this all of the time, I still do actually with hurricanes. You know, after a hurricane watch or warning or after a tornado watch or warning, you'll have people that return back to their homes and it almost seems like they're a little disappointed that their home's still standing because they took all of this time to evacuate and do all of these things that took them out of their normal routines and it's, everything's okay and that's a good thing. Well, the same thing with social distancing. The numbers, you know, could be higher had we not social distance. So the fact that we wrap those numbers down means that those mitigative measures actually did what they were supposed to do. But yet, a lot of times people will see those end numbers and say, oh, they were over exaggerating this or it, was a, it wasn't as bad. No, our actions made it as not as bad as it could have been. And so it's hard for people to sort of internalize that, particularly when there are real issues at play, mm -hmm. people are hurting the economy's bad, people are losing their jobs, um, there are mental uh, health issues because of this. Understand all of those things. But, you know, as I told someone, because someone came to me and said, well, you know, if you're still getting a paycheck, you don't understand, that's why you want this to be over, that's why you wanted the social distancing to continue. No, it's actually the opposite. I'm more concerned that if we take actions too soon, 
we're gonna end up exacerbating our situation and even having more extensive lockdowns, which further harms the economy and people more. And so that, that's why there's been this delicate balance. I don't envy any policymaker because they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. fighting two battles here. They're fighting the coronavirus and they're fighting uh, keeping the economy uh, healthy as well. This is why people that you know, take on public service, you know, there's a specialness to it. If you take it with a humble heart and a servant's heart, you can't be selfish about it. You just have to make the right decisions and they're not always gonna be the right decisions on either side of the ledger. You just have to make what you feel is the right decision for people. And so that's what we as scientists do as well. You know, people, you know, we talk about weather forecasting, climate change, whatever. People say, oh, you guys are exaggerating this or that, or you're overhyping this. No, we just, we're, generally scientists tend to be uh, a bit more conservative than people think. We don't like to be hyperbolic. We don't like mm -hmm. to sort of be sort of exaggerated. And so we just sort of tell you what the data shows us and let people make decisions based on that. Yeah, when you have a, a storm like a Hurricane Michael, you don't need to be hyperbolic. It's bad enough and we no. need to pay attention to those things. One of the things I wanted to ask you was, is there any truth or tell us about this COVID situation and everybody being um, quarantined, less travel, and climate, has it had effect on climate change? Or has that, what are we seeing with the atmosphere and things there? You know, not, not so much climate change itself, but what we have seen is a change that's related to climate change in the fact that um, carbon emissions in the atmosphere are down about 17%. 17%. So we're probably putting 17% less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when we were at the peak of the, the sort of stay at home or shelter in place. In addition to that, based on some NASA data, and I, I, my, I used to be at NASA before I was at the University of Georgia, some NASA satellite data shows that air pollution is down as well uh, because mm -hmm. they use a metric from the satellite called nitrogen dioxide, which comes out of our tailpipes, which comes out of factories and so forth. So obviously those numbers are down. So here's the good news and the bad news in that. The good news is pollution's down, carbon dioxide amounts or emissions are down. The bad news is when we do normalize, they're probably gonna go right back up mm -hmm. to sort of their levels of concern. But from my perspective as a scientist, one of the things that I often hear from people, and I'm a, I'm a scientist of faith, I have no problem admitting that. But I often will have people come up to me and say, well, I don't think people or humans can change the weather or the climate. I think it's blasphemous to say that we can, or I think it's just arrogance. I think this shows people that we can. Oh, I think this, this, this lockdown period has shown us that our activities do affect our atmosphere. And the physics is pretty clear. When we have more CO2, uh, it leads to a greenhouse effect that, uh, now, by the way, the greenhouse effect gives, gets a bad rap. <laughs> Let me, we need the greenhouse effect. If we didn't have it, we couldn't live on this planet. One of my colleagues, Scott Denning in Colorado State, says something that's very provocative. He says, the reason we know that there's a greenhouse effect in our atmosphere is that we survive every night. Mm -hmm. Think about what I said, we survive every night, which means if we didn't have this greenhouse warming, we'd be too cold like some of the other planets mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be able to survive. So we need that carbon dioxide. It's just that when we have a bit too much of it as we do now uh, the system is out of equilibrium. So last uh, question or almost last question, I have one for you at the very mm -hmm. end. Um, is there any correlation or advice on preparing mm -hmm. for hurricane season, which you are right, many of those listening are in Florida. Most of our alumni are located in Florida. Um, preparing for hurricane season and maintaining uh, good COVID practices of social distancing, you, you know, wearing your mask in stores, is what, what overlap there needs to be considered? Well, you know, again, I, I, when I go out to the hardware store or the grocery store, I'm wearing a mask. And, you know, oddly, this has become a political sort of flashpoint mm -hmm. for people, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a left or right issue. In the same way with climate change, I often say the ice doesn't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, it just melts. And I, I think the virus doesn't care what our political leanings are as well. So it's just mm -hmm. good public practice. But I, I think, you know, I wrote something uh, a few months ago in Forbes when there was a tornado warning. Uh, I can't remember exactly where it was because it came up with this, okay, well, what do people do? Because there's some people that have to go to tornado shelters. Mm -hmm. How do they go to a tornado shelter and get social distance? So the American Meteorological Society, which I, I presided over in 2013, issued guidance. It said default to the CDC guidelines first, 
But if you do have to go to a shelter, try as much as possible to do that. Now, in hurricane situations, you don't typically evacuate the shelter. You typically are doing more mass evacuations. And so I think it leads to a different sort of perspective. Why did we get really dark? There we, I think it leads to a different perspective on how to deal with coronavirus. But my, my, my sort of first order is to make sure we're just leading with sort of the best CDC or public health guidance we can. Yeah, you said- and I'm gonna change, I'm, I'm still listening, yeah. keep talking. Go ahead, you said 2020 was the year that keeps on giving, and I think it also is the year that's gonna really demonstrate how well we all care and keep each other, um, you know, as neighbors and community and all of those things that we'll have to keep, in, keep into account as we face the second half of this year. Last question, arguably the most important, what is your favorite FSU memory? <laughs> Oh, that's a tough one because I have three degrees from there. So I spent a lot of time there. So yeah. That's a tough, I have, I have a lot of good ones. You know, I pledged my fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha there. I got a lot of good memories there just in that process and even being president of the chapter there. I met my wife there mm -hmm. uh, in grad school. You know, a good story. I mean, I, you know, I, I met my wife. Uh, we were both in grad school and I was studying for my doctoral preliminary exams at the time when I happened to meet her. So of course I'm doing all these things that I'm to date her and trying to take her out and do all these things when I should have been studying. <laughs> uh, but and at the same time, it was also around March. So it was March Madness and I love college basketball. So I'm watching all the games. I'm trying to date my wife and do all these things and my prelims are coming up. Luckily, thankfully, <laughs> I did well on those doctorals and exams and I'm here today. But that's just an inter interesting story. To, yeah. Because when I came back to FSU, uh, I took a sabbatical from NASA to do my doctorate before going back to NASA. Uh, had no plans to meet my wife when I came back to Florida State, and I did. So, you know, Florida State and college in general is a nice proving ground for developing ourselves, for meeting our future significant others, and just sort of enrichment of uh, an expansion of something. I, you know, I had the the fortunate to be able to, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to deliver the commencement address at Florida State a couple of years ago. And one of the things I talked about is that we all need to expand our radius. If you think back to your old geometry class, the area of a circle is pi r squared, where r is radius. We have personal radiuses too, those radii, if you will. They, were, they are influenced by how we grew up, our political backgrounds, our, our faith-based backgrounds. But when we expand our radius, we expand our circle and it, and it opens us to broader and different perspectives and it allows us to give broader and different perspectives as well. Well, I am so thankful. I have to tell those who are listening that when I contacted you, I know how busy you are. And I know that you have just so much going on and so many demands on your time, particularly as we head into the season, then you put a pandemic on top of that. But when I emailed you, you got back in touch with me immediately. And oh, so the thing. We all are. We are all very excited to talk with you today. And you just, people like you make our university better and you're clearly making a difference in the world and in our behaviors and our knowledge and interaction with our communities and the world. So thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with us. I want you all to join us next week for our eighth Wednesday webinar. We'll have FSU alumna and faculty member Carol Campbell Edwards, and she'll share tips for finding joy in the workplace. So I hope you stay connected. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much. And as always, go Knowles. Go Knowles. <laughs>